Hi everyone, I'm Anita Little. I'm the politics editor at Playboy and from covering social justice in California, a state that was one of the latest to legalize cannabis, there's just this overwhelming sense of what comes next. What do we need to do as a society to ensure that the pleasure that cannabis brings isn't only for the privileged? Playboy has covered the battleground of mari marijuana legalization since the 1960s. Most notably in 1970, the Playboy Foundation gave a founding grant to the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, NORML, which is now one of the country's premier pro-cannabis legalization advocacy groups. Today we are building on our legacy of advocacy by pushing for real reform and policy changes that will not just destigmatize, but decriminalize cannabis. At the same time, the way cannabis is classified on a federal level as a Schedule I substance limits the basic pursuit of pleasure. And it also, of course, disproportionately impacts communities of color. I am enthusiastic to open a discussion today with, about these issues with a range of local leaders, including Monica Tang, a pharmacist and board member for the Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, Verena Von Fiften, co-founder of the cannabis-infused lifestyle magazine Gossamer, Nelson Guerrero, co-founder and executive director for the Cannabis Cultural Association, a New York-based nonprofit focused on, on helping marginalized and underrepresented communities engage in the legal cannabis industry, and Andrew Ferrier, co-founder of Greenbox New York, a curated monthly subscription box featuring the latest CBD and hemp products that is positioned to become New York City's first major cannabis monthly subscription box when it's eventually legalized. And finally, this panel will be moderated by my colleague, the amazing Ariella Cozen, Playboy's cannabis editor. So I'm gonna give the floor over to her, and thanks for being here, everybody. Hi, everybody. So I started to think about how I was gonna start this panel, and I started to think about how surreal it is that I'm the cannabis editor. Um, and I was thinking about my earliest memories consuming cannabis, and I started to think about my sisters here somewhere. Um, oh, there she is. Um, <laughs> in terms of, uh, she got in trouble for smoking weed for the first time, and my mom talked about it like grass, so I went in our backyard and I smoked grass. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, 10, 15 years later, I'm here, the resident expert at Playboy, which leads me to my first question with you guys. Um, can you talk about your first memories, um, maybe a funny memory with cannabis? Uh, I can go first, except what I was gonna, I know you sort of sent us this question, I, I should have prepared <laughs> a little bit more. But I, so I'm originally from Vancouver, Canada, um, and cannabis has been like culturally decriminalized there for as long as I can remember. Uh, so I don't actually remember my first time smoking weed, but I know I was very young. <laughs> um, I'm 36 now, I just turned 36, and so whenever I talk about Gossamer, I say like I've been smoking weed for over 20 years. Um, I think I actually smoked weed for the first time when I was like 12 or 13. I'm not necessarily encouraging that, but I turned out okay. Um, yeah, I don't have a, a, a strong memory of it other than it was just very, very accessible and something that wasn't super uh, stigmatized, at least in my experience. Mine is more literary. Um, I was reading The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, and <laughs> it was this chapter about Sinbad the Sailor. So I was reading it, and then I like was in my living room, so I looked up at my older brother, he's now a pharmacist too, and I looked at my mom, she's a registered nurse at the time, and I was like, what is this drug they're talking about, this hashishish? And they <laughs> started laughing at me, and they're like, it's called hash, that's weed, reefer, ganja, cannabis, marijuana, it has a lot of different names, and I was like, this is the drug that they're talking about, weed, that's the same thing. And they're like, yeah, you should probably start learning more about it. And I was really surprised by the response. And they were just, I mean, I was in middle school at the time. So they were just like, yeah, there's a lot to know about it. It's actually a really interesting drug. So I started researching it from there. Like it was always something that I was interested in and intrigued by. 
Well, uh, for me, uh, my, my family was very anti-marijuana. You know, being first-generation immigrant Latino, they were, uh, you know, money one always bad. But, of course, like any other high school kid, and, uh, I got in the <laughs> backseat of my buddy's van and on our way to a movie and had my first joint. Uh, and I loved it ever since and been a big fan ever since then. Um, well, I'm going to have a bit of a disappointing answer. I actually <laughs> just started consuming. So That's great. Uh, right. I'm from, Congratulations. So I'm originally from Alabama. I'm from the Deep South, and our company is developing our app and everything out of Atlanta. So it's still heavily criminalized. In Georgia so uh, it's not the safest thing to really try to engage in but being that we're launching like a CBD and hemp box I've gotten hundreds of like samples so I've of course tried like topicals creams um, tincture stuff like that so I'm really learning about just the, the entirety of the plant as a as a beginner in, in the experience so I can definitely say I, I kind of see an overall um, benefit of it and in terms of the way that Playboy talks about cannabis. We talk about it as a portal to pleasure. Would you guys agree with that statement? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, when we were sort of coming up with the idea behind Gossamer, we wanted to emphasize that you are not defined by smoking weed and that if you smoke weed, it's probably like the fifth or tenth or fiftieth thing you might tell someone about yourself. Um, but that most people's relationship to cannabis is like cannabis and then what, right? Like you're doing it to heighten some particular experience. And that could be for health purposes, for sleep, for pain, or you want to have like a good time with your partner. And so I think the idea of it just heightening or offering like a higher quality experience to whatever you do, I mean, that to me is like the entire reason people consume. Um, that applies to almost everything. And I think that's why you're starting to see also publications and brands and products really like come out and address that because both of those things are stigmatized, right? Like cannabis and then, you know, sexual health and sexual ple pleasure, particularly for women. So I think that's been the most exciting part of the industry is, is seeing these products come out that address those things that um, haven't really been talked about. Absolutely, historically, we've had, humans have had an intimate relationship with the cannabis plant for thousands of years across countries, continents, civilizations, and people are using it, looking to it for non-medical, ritualistic, spiritual reasons or medicinal purposes. And it does have benefits in terms of, it works on the endocannabinoid system, which people are increasingly learning more about. The ECS system is part of our body. We've evolved as humans and certain animals have these receptors that are prone to and developed to react to cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. So THC is mind altering and euphoric. It gives people the high and the munchies, but it also gives them pain relief and anxiety relief. And cannabidiol, CBD is another cannabinoid and that has non-intoxicating and so many diverse potential therapeutic effects. And it acts on the reward pleasure pathway. So if you can reduce anxiety, you can reduce stress, you can be calm because of the cannabinoids that you've introduced into the body, then you're more primed to enjoy sex. So. It's physiological. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Monica, I did want you to elaborate a little bit more. I, as the cannabis editor at Playboy specifically, I get a lot of marketing material about sex products, stuff that will, in, in, I don't know, increase your pleasure during sex specifically, mm -hmm. like for, yeah, stuff like that. Can you talk a bit about why people are leaning so deeply into the sex market in, in collaboration with cannabis? Yes, um, well I think it transcends so many markets like health and wellness because we're talking about this holistic approach to healing and sex and pleasure are like also all intimately intertwined. It's about this whole wellness approach, this whole having complementary and alternative methods of approaching how you take care of yourself, take care of your body and then because it has physical and then psycho uh, psychological effects, that's all gonna tie into your sexual experience. So it, it's synergistic for the markets to buy into this. I mean, who doesn't go into a corner store or a gas station where there's CBD on the shelves and it's all available everywhere. It's really gonna flood all these markets. So this one is definitely going to wanna tap into that. We can't really talk about pleasure without talking about privilege when it comes to pleasure. and. The reason why we selected each and every one of you is because um, you all are committed to talking about pleasure 
with the understanding that there is some socioeconomic undertones, there's gender undertones, there's race undertones. Can you all talk a bit about, and I know this is a loaded question, about how each of your um, organizations that you're representing today um, speak to that fact and how you're wanting to move forward that conversation about pleasure connected to privilege? I mean, uh, that's why my organization was started to begin with. You know, m my co-founder and I, uh, met in 2015 at one of these uh, original industry events. So New York uh, at the time had just uh, rolled out medical and passed in 2014. The first operator was starting to open up their doors and w we would go to these industry events. He was the only African American in the room. I'm the only Latino in the room. So obviously we connected <laughs> after that and uh, we just kept asking how do we get more people that look like us you know, as these speakers and, and having a piece in this industry. And when no one gave us a, a straight answer, no one was really there to help us, we said we're, we're going to do this on our own. We're going to start our organization, start getting our people together and engage with the community and educating them. And that was really the birth of our organization was to combat that. And since then, we've grown it, gotten some great board members who have really helped us guide it to now we're seeing some people from our first couple events now starting their own cannabis companies. And that's really the beauty of, of, of what we're in. But the reality is, you know, we make up people of color, make up the, the prison industry and, and not the legal industry. And that's where we need to make that big change. Yep, right. absolutely. Um, I would say it's definitely a underrepresentation, and like you said, people like us, we we have the responsibility to to really allow people to transition their talent into cannabis because it being such a new industry, everybody needs to have a seat at the table, um, and then and it, and it takes experts in each facet of it. Like everyone sitting up here has expertise mm -hmm. in a separate sector of cannabis, and so like our company, we're starting like a social equity accelerator. Um, we're meeting with like New York State senators, and, and the thing that I love about you know, New York and New Jersey as someone from the Deep South is the awareness of it, right? So I think that's the first thing is to identify that, you know, people aren't represented in this, even though everybody consumes it, um, and, and people are making, you know, billions of dollars in this. But a lot of people don't understand how to, you know, how do I start a startup? How do I get funded? You know, how do I position my company to get the attention that it needs to scale, right? So that's kind of what our, our uh, 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 goal is with our accelerator. But it definitely takes everyone from each segment of cannabis to actually progress that forward. Yeah. Uh, Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, DFCR, was founded in 2015 by Dr. David Nathan. He's a Princeton-based psychiatrist, and he is trailblazing, renowned and recognized for his work. He is a psychiatrist specializing in psychosis, and DFCR is a nonprofit advocacy group. We have hundreds of members, and it it's, rich, it's the first of its kind to be physician majority based for membership, but I'm a doctor of pharmacy. I'm a registered pharmacist. We have other doctors with their specialty with a PhD. We have law experts, JDs, and it doesn't have to be physicians only. Um, we are going to be factual and intentional in, in, in combating the myths surrounding cannabis around not only psychosis, but the gateway drug myth that a lot of people still are caught up on because they don't know the most recent relevant research and data. So um, DFCR works to educate the healthcare community, other clinicians who are still buying into the stigma and other untruths, and then also engaging with policymakers, legislators, other regulators about what is factual, what's evidence-based, what the data tells us, and how we can work together and collaborate with the healthcare community of other researchers and clinicians to draft sensible drug policy, and then to also right the past wrongs of the harms inflicted on the most marginalized communities since the drug war. Yep. So Gossamer, we describe Gossamer as a lifestyle publication. So we're not a political publication. We are not um, a B2B publication. But we built in what we hope is our way of um, helping drive the conversation forward around a socially just and diverse and equal cannabis industry into everything we do. Um, so I'm white, my co-founder is a white man, um, so we run a company that is founded by white people. Um, so we can't speak to experiences that we haven't had, um, but what we can do is try and offer our platform in every way, shape, and form to uh, share the experiences of others or allow them to tell their stories. And uh, the other thing we talk about a lot is if you are a consumer that is interested in the cannabis space and, and you want to sort of like level up your experience or you want to know like where to buy the pretty pipe that will look good next to your like beautiful lamp, well know that this is the brand that you should give your money to. These are the dispensaries you should go to because they've been operating in this space for 20 or 30 years. Um, we also um, 
do a lot of nonprofit work. We work with the Women's Prison Association here. They're the oldest women's advocacy group in the country, and they work with women in all stages of criminal justice. Is there a clear path to um, to inclusivity while you're discussing? Because this is such a complex conversation, yeah. and I have trouble as a white woman myself explaining this as well. It's so multi-layered. I think when it comes down to it, it really comes down to each state law. Uh, we saw here in New York, which failed now twice, is the MRTA, which would have given the opportunity to be the most progressive language. Yeah. Right now, Illinois seems yeah. to be the one with the most progressive language. Massachusetts has done a fantastic job of slowly rolling out their social equity program, as well as California with Prop yeah. 64. Nothing is perfect yet, but that's what we're striving for. And it has to come twofold. It has to come from, the, from our, our legislature at the state level. But it also comes down to the corporate, the private sector, to do to do right by the people. When it comes yeah. to corporate social responsibility, to have these larger operators create their own programs to give back and reinvest in these communities. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. There are so many ways to to be included in the industry. These transferable skills could be banking, accounting, whether it's like fi finance, law, and healthcare. I mean, it's even going to schools. I teach at medical schools, pharmacy schools, universities are um, increasingly becoming aware that we have to re-educate everyone because they need yeah. to know about the terms and the legal history, all these things. Um, again, for inclusivity, it's having these conversations about like, yes, you, you have skills, skills that are immediately applicable in this market as it's emerging and evolving constantly. Consumers have an absolutely mind-blowing amount of power. Consumers need to put their money towards brands that are doing good and ask a brand what they're doing. They should be doing something. The way I feel is like, okay, so when you talk about like diversity, inclusion, bringing, you know, more diverse equity into the space, right? I can only speak for black people and broke people, right? Because that's what I grew up around. So for us, it's more like we do see a little bit of representation within cannabis, but most like black cannabis legal entrepreneurs are entertainers or celebrities, right? So the average everyday black person, even when I would tell people what I'm trying to do, they just think it's too expensive, mm -hmm. right? Or they just feel like there's no real like navigable way to actually get your license, get funded, open up a store or you know some type of app or some type of ancillary project. So I think for the first thing that people need to see, people of color or anyone who's just underfunded, is just to see that it, it is actually, you can pull it it's off. Doable. Right? So a lot of black people growing up, we still feel like it's a stigma that is attached to us if we even try to enter cannabis, right? So first we have to remove that by seeing everyday black founders create um, networks and programs and, and positive platforms. I think that's the first step. And then the second step is, like she, like she spoke to earlier, is actually getting to a point where we can actually get funded, where we can mm -hmm. get invested in. Because even us being a black founded company, companies who are far less developed than us with far less talent or progress are getting four or five times what we're getting offered for half the equity. Sure. So we get we get a VC telling us, oh, we want 30, 35%, where we'll read about a competitor who gave up maybe six or seven percent, you know, for a similar project that they have not gotten as far as we've gotten. Yep. So it's definitely not a, a level playing field, but I've also been black my entire life, so I knew it wasn't gonna be fair coming into it. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's cool, but you know, it's just about progress. You know, we can sit around and, and, and we can, you know, complain and we can say these people aren't doing this, or we can just do it for ourselves. So I think that's just the first step is just us actually galvanizing um, everyone who wants to be a part of this industry to get into the industry. There are immediately effective, actionable steps that you can take to include diversity, inclusivity, equity in the conversation of legalization, and that's by joining groups. Canicultural, for sure. Um, they do amazing work. Canaclusive, Minorities for Medical Marijuana. Go out there, find groups that you can join. They have the same mission, and if we can continue to push the topic and the discussions about diversity, inclusivity, it's got to get recognized. And I know from personal experience with doctors, I'm always afraid to tell them that I smoke weed yeah. or that I consume it in any way. What do you say to those types of doctors when you're going in to educate people? You need to learn about the most recent and relevant research. People are always pushing back that there's not enough data, but there is a lot of data. So I point them to the resources that are available. In 2017, the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine published an over 400-page uh, report about the therapeutic efficacy, about the science and the pharmacology, the really finer nuanced facts about cannabis, cannabinoids, so many different things. Um, and the clinical 
indications that they have for appropriateness in chronic conditions. So there is data, um, and there's emerging data daily that's coming in from Canada, Australia, the UK, Israel, uh, Germany has mm -hmm. really good data. So I always am urging them, I provide them the resources, I send them the research, and then I tell them to continually educate themselves to be factual and objective about what they're learning. And my final question before we open it up to questions from the audience. Um, like I've said before, 10 years ago, I did not think we were going to be in the place that we are today. Me neither. What do you guys hope for the next 10 years? Uh, what I can say is I just hope for equity, right? And like the so whole social equity conversation comes around like just, um, you know, many facets of people participating in the space, right? But I mean equity is in a sense of if you're black, if you're a, if you're a woman, if you're a minority, Asian, Hispanic, whatever, you need to get into this industry while it's still time to create something that you own a percentage of, right? Because this is something that's, that's going to continue to grow whether or not people pay attention to it. You know, like states are going to continue to legalize. It eventually, it's going to legalize federally. And I just really believe in people actually being able to benefit from something like this where it has affected me personally, my family for generations. I've seen it. You know, I've interacted with it. So this is an opportunity for people to go into a new industry where people are happy to invest. People are happy to pay attention to. You can get attention lended to what you're trying to do. And you can help people in the meantime and make money. There's not really many industries that offer all of these things right now, and it's exciting. Like, you meet the coolest people in the world being within cannabis, right? So it's a lot better than working in a job that you are never going to own, and they'll always be able to kind of control your trajectory. Like, this is an opportunity for, if you're, if you're a creator, if, if you um, are talented in supply chain or distribution or artificial intelligence, anything, concierge, anything, like, you will be able to find a way in this industry where you can create something that benefits people and how they interact with it, and you'll be able to actually bring other people along with you. I think that's kind of where the industry should continue to go. Agreed. And I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see federal and international legalization at a scale that we've never seen before. And for the first time in a, in a lifetime, we're going to see something go from being highly illegal to now illegal. Only other time we've seen that was alcohol prohibition. And now we're going to create all this new industry. And just to piggyback off what you said, equity and inclusion. You know, if we have the opportunity to do it right now. If we yeah. don't do it right now, it's, it's not going to work out that way. And it's, it's going to be mass big weed, and it's, no one's going to have equity. That's why it's extremely important that people get active, call their legislators, get involved, uh, and be knowledgeable about this. You know, five years ago, I never thought in the life of me I'd ever be involved in the cannabis space. You know, it was my abuelo getting sick. Uh, with cannabis and having him do tinctures and meeting Jake and my co-founders that I, even got me the opportunity to be here. And it's incredible that we're, we're, still, we're still growing this. And I think that's the beauty of this industry. There is no, you know, the sky's the limit and we got to keep pushing it to make sure we, we get there. Before we move forward, we also have to look back and we have to really, again, right the past harms we've inflicted on the most marginalized communities yep. that have been crippled by the war on drugs. Like, it is just offensive. Yeah. We can't. Uh, the, the legal market is like projected to be worth billions so of dollars around the world. And Trillions. what about Trillions, going yeah. back and then offering restitution, offering training, education, opportunities to form co-ops and partnerships where you don't have to have the million, billion dollars of buy-in so that you can be adequately funded to open your doors in any avenue of non-vertically integrated cannabis business. And we need to address that. And yeah. again, like dismantle what's the current like parameters and barriers that are ways that hinder people the most because if it's going to be worth billions, a rising tide lifts all ships. Yep. Like, let's give everyone the opportunity so yeah. that we can all be in this, so we can all play in the sand, like, and get yeah. along. <laughs> it's, <laughs> the, it's, I went to, um, was sort of, like, got a, a, a ghost invite, or I, I, I should not have been there, but it was a, a, ca a cannabis <laughs> investor conference that was held in New York um, maybe about a month ago at, uh, like, I don't know, some big fancy hotel in Midtown. Um, and I walked in and I was, tr I, I knew, like I knew what the space looked like. I knew what investors look like, broadly speaking. And I, I had an understanding that, you know, when money comes into the space, what it looks like. But to walk into a giant conference room in a hotel in Midtown and see nothing but a sea of white men in suits and maybe a handful of white women 
like five, and then maybe one or two people of color against probably like north of 500 white men in suits. And it's like the biggest cannabis investment conference in the world. Like that's what the industry looks like, period. That's what it looks like right now. So that's what we need to do and what consumers need to fight against. And that's not easy. It's not like just talking on a panel. It's actually like putting your money where your mouth and your morals are. And that comes down to brands and consumers. I can't stress that enough. True. And I'll piggyback off what she said, the, the last statement she made about a rising tide lifting all ships. People need your talent in the cannabis space. Like, if you just take out your phone and go on a lot of these brands and these companies, like, their marketing isn't sure. what you would expect it to be. People just have money. They can just afford to do things. But, like, there aren't, like, as far as, like, graphic artists, image design, you would be surprised how much talent that companies are in search of. Yeah to come into the cannabis space and they pay you really well. And to support nonprofits, one of the things I always say, it, it doesn't have to be money um, if you don't have a lot of like disposable income or if you're a small brand like we are. Um, we work with nonprofits in the space to design their creative. So we like basically like loan out our in-house creative and say, do you need to create social assets? Do you need to create like a print ad that will run in our magazine for free, but that then you can turn around and use elsewhere? And so like it's also non-monetary skills or, or ways to donate your time and expertise to organizations that are trying to um, push this conversation forward and that don't necessarily have the resources um, that other people might have in order to do that. Yeah, and a Cannabis Cultural Association can always use more volunteers. We're, we're a nonprofit. We're doing a lot of work at the local level, state level, and federally. So if you reach out to us, there's always a lot of opportunities. And a lot of opportunities come to us in our inbox every day. Shout out to Playboy. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Um, thank you. That was phenomenal. My question, I feel like we, we all know the benefits of cannabis, of CBD. Uh, there has been a little bit of a backlash, people saying it doesn't work, but in part because things are being mislabeled. Or like you find bodega CBD or people are putting it in coffee. Do you think that that is a real issue we're up against? Um, and how do we educate people on which brands to go after that are actually using it and applying it the right way? A lot of it, uh, the concerns around just consistency, standardization, and accountability, whereas like we don't have the rules and regulations for all the other products, foods and other like cosmetics and things that we're introducing into the body for purity, um, potency, and sanitation where it's like not contaminated, expired, or has like mold and mildew. That's like a huge concern right now as it stands. Um, but teaching people that they should look, if they're going to a product, yeah, it's not the best idea to go to a gas station for your <laughs> CBD. Um, I know that that is, it could be, co that's common sense. It's not necessarily common knowledge. Um, so going to have these conversations with everyone is important, starting there. Um, but then also looking for something that we call a certificate of authenticity. COA. The mm -hmm. COA, yeah. The COA is going to be third-party testing that validates the product that you are reading about on the label is what it says, it's, and it is what it says it's. It is. Yeah. So um, a COA is important to look for when you're looking at CBD products or like hemp derived or anything. And then due diligence by researching that manufacturer and the, the retailer that you're engaging with to see like how long have they been operational? Like what licenses do they have? Like the products and going into the history because the entities that are corporate social responsible groups and they are good players will post these third yeah. party results. They won't do in-house testing, but if they do in-house testing, they'll have another party that tests the product. So reading the labels, reading the percentages and understanding and packaging is important. Like if it is in something that's stable, like amber bottles for like CBD water. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's like in a clear plastic bottle, that is not necessarily safe. Um, it's not necessarily stable. Yeah. So learning those things, understanding those things, um, the information is out there a lot. A good resource to follow is uh, Americans for Safe Access. They yeah. have been ASA. in the space for mm -hmm quite some time. They are doing phenomenal work. Trailblazers, really. Um, and they actually produce really um, easily to understand, easily easy to read materials that are guidebooks. They actually just did a CBD handbook. And there are also ways that they address current good manufacturing practices so that you make sure that you're using a safe and stable product. Yeah. The last thing I'll say on the um, third party testing is specifically also look for batch testing because a lot of the time you will see third party tests that a brand has run on a single version of its product once upon a right. time. Um, so what you want is to know that the product you are buying, the batch you are purchasing from, you want to see what's in that. Because otherwise it's, otherwise it's very, very easy for a brand to be like, oh, sure, here's our third-party test dated from you know February 2012 um, on... Right 
this particular batch that we sent to the third party for this testing. So you need to look at batch testing and make sure there's a lot number that aligns with um, the what you're purchasing. And that's so much work, right? Like all you want to do is like log in and have your credit card like auto auto fill in and hit purchase and have <laughs> it show up at your door the next day. Like you don't want to have to send emails and then wait for two days for someone to respond and get it. But like that's what you need to do right now to make sure you're getting the right product. And also don't assume that like the big retailers are doing that work for you. They are not. They are really, really not. Like particularly brands that or retailers that don't um, typically work with the space. So as you see this proliferation of CBD and you see products at Barney's and Nordstrom's, they're not doing that testing. Like Barney's doesn't know what they're testing for when they're selling a CBD brand. They're right. picking it based on packaging. So what you need to do is go to the brands and then also, as you already said, like go to places that have already been operating in, in the space and, and get recommendations from them. Um, it's been in sort of a difficult legislative uh, year in the Northeast uh, trying to get marijuana legalized. New Jersey didn't succeed. New York didn't succeed this week. Connecticut has not succeeded. Rhode Island has not succeeded. Illinois has. What can we learn from what has just transpired with all the failure to get adult use cannabis legalization you know, um, in New York and all the Northeast states? Now, Illinois passed, and I thought that was a good lesson. Mm -hmm. What did they do? that we're not doing, and what can we learn from this, uh, this series of events that have just transpired? They showed up in numbers. Yeah. You know, when yeah. it comes down to it, when we do these uh, lobby days at the local state level, the, in Illinois, they showed up with heavy numbers. They showed up to the Capitol in thousands. They, at these local public forums, which we did a, a lot of, there's a lot of folks that are anti-cannabis, and they'll come there spewing their propaganda, talking about how dogs are going to lose their employment uh, as far being law enforcement dogs. That's the type <laughs> of, st it, and I kid you not, you know, in public forums in Northern Westchester, we have chiefs of police saying that 40 dogs will no longer be employed because they won't be able to smell the difference between drugs. But that's the type of stuff that, you know, gets headlines, gets these constituents rallied up in the wrong way. Illinois did a great job of rallying support for it, yes. and they had the most progressive language to date. Yep. Um, with homegrown included on the medical side, uh, obviously we'd like to see homegrown for everybody, but mm -hmm. hey, that's a great first step, and there's, that's something we can all look, at, look to as being an example, and hopefully their rollout over the next 18 months will, be, will go smoothly. But ho that's that type of pressure that we need to keep uh, putting on here in New York or in New Jersey, because yeah. we know one goes legal, the other one's got to do it too. Right, they're looking at each other <laughs> and competing. Um, I will say, while New Jersey is having a lot of e issues with legalization, medical did get expanded for the medical program. So yep. A20 did pass, and there are more uh, protections and provisions written in that prioritize patients. So that's a win for medical patients in Jersey, which is great. Um, that program has come a long way since its inception because it was crippled by a governor that was anti-cannabis and it was expensive for patients. It's one of the most expensive states to pay out of pocket for your cannabis. Um, but speaking to adult use legalization, it is definitely engaging and joining organizations where you can combine forces and go to lobby day where you can advocate and raise awareness and talk to these policymakers, regulators, and engage them in these conversations because commonly they still think it is a gateway drug. Yeah. And we know with science and research that that is not the case, but it's engaging them and educating them and then curating this awareness and then telling them the benefits of legalization. We can research it. People won't be mass incarcerated for it. Like there are so many ways like we could regulate and standardize the industry. We could have like actual parameters to follow in place for like accountability and transparency. So engaging, going to lobby day, um, continuing to, to let them know that legalization is the right way, not this compromise with decriminalization. Thank you guys. Thanks so guys. Much. Thank you.